Romans chapter 13, verse 11. Now, uh, before we begin, I, I want you to look up on your screen here. Uh, on September 19, September 19, 2020, this 15-digit clock, uh, located in the heart of Manhattan, New York City, it, for the last 20 years uh, and, and continually now, it displayed and it continues to display uh, time in a very unique way. They, they make it so that it, it, you have to kind of figure out how, how they're displaying the time at times. But this 15-digit clock, instead of showing the time for an entire week, they, it didn't show time at all. Instead, it, it was a countdown. And this countdown, what it was meant to depict was the amount of time before the world could not return back from the adverse effects of climate change. And as this, uh, the artist that went ahead and put this together, artist Gan Golan and activist Andrew Boyd, they spoke to reporters and they stated that during this climate week when they had put this up, this, they said, was most arguably the most important number in the world. And then they further went on to say that it was placed in New York City because it needed to send a strong message. It needed to send a strong message that the earth has a deadline, is what they said. Now, regardless of what your stance is on climate change or the message that these men were going ahead and, and putting, whatever we think, the simple truth is there is that profound statement that was made is actually extremely true but it wasn't exactly what they were meaning by it. What do I mean by that? I mean that the, the earth indeed does have a deadline. There is a time where it will be done away with. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, Peter goes ahead and he talks about this end coming, this time where the world will be no more. And he says, but the day of the Lord will be like a thief, in, uh, a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. So I want to ask you, how much thought have you given this week to the end coming? How much thought have you been giving to the Lord coming right now? You see, speaking for myself, it, it, well, I, I, I'm not a really good gauge because I, I'm, I put this lesson together. But before this time frame, I will tell you day in and day out, the thought of God and doing his will and doing the things of God, those things are always in my mind. But for the Lord to come right now, the, the thought of when the Lord is coming, can it be right now, those thoughts for somehow, some way get lost in the shuffle. Because a lot of times the things of life kind of take precedence. They start to kind of overcompensate my mind. The thoughts of doing things, the day in, day out kind of monotony of life, the stuff that I have to make sure are done, that kind of takes center stage. And I would probably venture to say that many of us are in that same way. That we, even reluctantly, we would have to admit that the things of this life kind of just roll. We have this kind of thing, and we sometimes forget that the Lord's coming is coming. Now, that doesn't mean to say, and I'm not trying to imply, that we forget about Christ, that we overlook the Lord. What I am saying is that sometimes we forget that that day may be today. That day may be in the next few seconds. You see, if everyone here was given the ability given the unique ability to go ahead and know for certain, 100%, that the Lord was going to come seven days from now. That judgment was going to happen, that the earth was going to be done away, that we knew we would stand in front of the Maker seven days from now. What type of lives would we lead? Where would we be? What would we do? Would it send us sprawling to go ahead and, and make changes in our lives, to prepare ourselves for the coming of the Lord, knowing full and well that we need to make some changes right now? 
because in seven days, it's, it's done. I don't have a chance. I know for a fact seven days is up. Would we become more astute Bible students? Would we now pray more, more diligently? Would we think about God's word more than we ever did? Would we go ahead and talk to our family members and make sure that they knew that the Lord was coming and they needed to get right? Would we do all those things? Or would we just live life? Let the life pass by. You see, although we don't have this unique ability, although we are told that the Lord's day will come like a thief in the night, that there will be a time where it will happen, and we don't know when that day is, the simple truth is seven days may be longer than what we have. Seven days may be far longer than what we have. The matter of fact is that the Lord may come this very hour. And are we prepared? Are we ready for that? The lesson title is entitled today, It's Time to Wake Up. And I want to go ahead and look at what Paul goes ahead and, and, and tells, what Paul says to the Christians here in Romans chapter 13, because he not only tells them it's time to wake up, but he tells them there's, it's time to do something about it. Now, in Romans chapter 13, just to give you kind of a brief kind of uh, understanding of where Paul has been at this uh, up to this point, in chapter 12, he has been ta telling the church there that they needed to make a transformation. There needs to be a transformation of their mind, and they need to start looking at one another in a loving manner. They need to make sure that they are loving one another without hypocrisy, abhorring evil, making sure that they are diligently seeking to take care of one another. That each and every member is important to the body of Christ. And then he goes on and he talks about, but it's not just loving one another in the brotherhood, but it's also loving our enemies and not to take revenge upon those who do us wrong. And then he goes on in, ver in chapter 13, and he starts addressing the Christian's responsibility to government. And he talks about how we need to behave because, not because we're, we're behaving towards government, but because we love the Lord. And we know that the Lord has put them into authority. And then in verses 8 and 9 of chapter 13, he now returns back to the concept of love. But this time, it's not towards just the brethren. He now talks about the love that we are supposed to have towards our neighbors. And he kind of recalls this same love that, that Christ told us. Remember how Christ told us the second commandment, the second greatest commandment? It's to love one another like we love ourselves. But then Paul continues in verse 11. So look with me in verse 11. He says, now remembering this, he says, do this knowing that the time is already, the hour is, I'm sorry, that, that it is time, that it is already the hour for, your, for you to awaken from sleep. For now, salvation is nearer to us than when we believe. The night is almost gone and the day is near. Therefore, let us, let, us, uh, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put away the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day, not carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in uh, strife or jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regards to its lust. Here Paul goes on and he says, look, knowing the things that we just talked about, knowing about this love, do this. And the first thing he says is you need to wake up. Understanding that you need to awaken from your slumber. Because salvation is nearer to us, he says. He says salvation is closer, one step closer. Is Paul saying that salvation is right around the corner? He's saying that regardless of the fact that we do not know when it's happening, when the judgment is coming, you are one day closer to meeting the Lord. You are one moment closer, and it draws near every single moment of our lives. Now, 
He also says that it might be hard to see this, that we are in darkness, that there is a darkness that surrounds us. This world is in darkness, but we need to understand that there is a daylight coming. There is day is coming near. That is the Lord is coming near. Paul makes it clear in these verses that there's a distinct difference. There's a difference between the, those that are in darkness and those that are in light. You see, in John chapter 3, verses 19 through 20, Christ goes ahead and he says, This is the judgment that the light has come into the world and that men love darkness rather than light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds were, are, are to be exposed. Here Christ says, look, the one that loves me, the one that wants to go ahead and do my will, he invites the word. Because even though the word goes ahead and exposes darkness, it lets them be guided into the right way. But the one that hates that, the one that is doing these evil deeds, doesn't want to have a spotlight shining on them. They don't want to understand the word. They don't want to hear the word because then they have to change. You have to do something. There's somebody telling you to do something. <laughs> and Paul says, there's a difference. Now, when we look at this, I, I think we have to be careful. We have to be careful because although we look at this and we can make application to this talking about those who are lost, there is tremendous application to that. Who is Paul talking to? You see, Paul is not going ahead and centering on the lost sinner at this time. The one that is unaware of Christ, unaware of the word. And how do we know that? Because in verse 11, in the latter portion of verse 11, he says, salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. In other words, these were Christians. These were those who had already accepted Christ, had already come to Christ, had already known the word, and he is telling them salvation has come closer to you. And these are the people that he's telling to wake up. See, sometimes we kind of look at society and we understand that society is lost and, and they have different things and we are telling them they need to hear the word. But here Paul is saying, I'm not talking to everyone in society, I'm talking to the Christian. And he's telling them firmly, we need to wake up and avoid becoming complacent about the truth. Be, uh, to becoming complacent about backsliding back into sin and doing the things of the world. See, Paul is saying, don't remain oblivious. Don't remain asleep. Understand your responsibilities to the light, to Christ. And understand that if you are not doing the things of, of Christ, judgment is pending for even us. Now, as we have already mentioned, that time, the time when Christ is coming is unknown to each and every one of us. But Paul implies here that it shouldn't scare us. That shouldn't be something that we're just stunned to know. And that shouldn't stun us when it happens. Remember, I talked about those seven days. If you knew, what if Christ came today? Would you be ready? Would it be a shock? Would you say, I I'm not ready now. This is not, how about tomorrow? Tomorrow I can get right. Look in 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, here, Paul going ahead and he's talking to the, those in Thessalonica. And he tells them this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. <clears throat> chapter 5, verses 2, beginning. Hold on a second, sorry. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning in verse 2. He says, For you yourselves know full and well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, as we just talked about. While they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. But you, brethren, but you, Christians, but you, church, are you in darkness that the day would overtake you like a thief? 
For you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of night nor of darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. For those who sleep are doing their sleeping at night, and those who get drunk get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love and the helmet of, of hope and salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining <laughs> salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. See, we are told that we shouldn't be surprised when the Lord comes. That it shouldn't be a shock to us and that it shouldn't take us like the thief of night because we are already preparing for that day. We have spent a lifetime preparing for Christ to come. That's what he is saying. Now, he goes ahead and he says, okay, well, if you're prepared, there are some things, there are some specific things that we as Christians should be preparing for. There should be a catalyst to do, to make some changes. And he talk, talking again to Christians, look at what he says, look back in Romans chapter 13. In Romans chapter 13, beginning in verse 12, he says, the night is almost gone and the day is near, therefore, therefore what? Let us lay aside deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. And then he says, let us not behave, uh, let us behave properly as in the day, not carousing and drunkenness. Here go, he, he first says, we need to put off those deeds of darkness. We need to ensure that we're not doing those things that we came out of. The picture that he goes ahead and also gives is that we need to behave Properly as in the day. What does he mean by that? You see, when a thief comes, we, we talk about the thief comes in the night. Why? Because in the day, everybody sees. He's exposed. There's no, no doing deeds of darkness where everybody is watching. And here, Paul says, we need to do everything as if, as if you're in the day. As if everybody is watching you. As you are exposed to the world. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 through 12, this is exactly what Peter is talking about. See, he calls us to maintain a specific pattern. Why? Look at what he says in, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11. He says, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts, which wage war against your soul. Keep your behavior excellent among Gentiles, so that in the thing which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. Here, Peter goes ahead, and he's been already talking about how we need to be holy people, that we are God's chosen people. And that we are a holy priesthood. But then he also goes on from this and he starts saying, well, look, we need to, if we know we're alien or we are, we are priests and we are supposed to be holy and we're supposed to be keeping ourselves holy, then as aliens, as people that are passing by that this is not their home, he goes ahead and he says, we need to abstain from fleshly lusts. The lusts that are always challenging us. But then he says, keep your behavior excellent. Keep your behaviors excellent among the Gentiles. Why is that? Because there's a saying that says, you might be the only Bible that someone reads. You see, our actions, the things that we do, how we respond to others, how we handle our life, whatever we say is under a microscope the minute you say you're a Christian. People are looking to see how you respond and what you do, how you act in times of challenge. Because this is going to make a difference between do they want to be a Christian or don't they? You see, if everybody looks at you and you are no different than anyone in the world, if you have the same problems and act the same exact way, then what point is it for me to go ahead and be a church? What point is it for me to read the scriptures if my life is just as bad as your life? If my joy is just as bad as your joy? If my love, it means nothing to me and it means nothing to you either. But you're different, you're unique. There's something about you that people can't pinpoint. They don't understand and that draws them to you. 
that draws them to the light of Christ. You see, when we go ahead and we understand this, then we understand that if we are not doing this, if we are not the true lights of the world, then we will either, one, help the word, we, we will do that by living the, the life that Christ calls us, or two, we will be the ones who will repel people. How many times have we heard, I don't go to church because they're hypocrites now? Because I saw so and so doing this and that. Brethren, there is always someone watching. There is always someone watching your actions and watching your deeds and hearing what you said. Yes, but even if there wasn't, the Lord is always watching. So let us ensure that we are doing the exact same thing. Paul goes ahead and he paints this picture this, uh, in, in the scriptures. He paints the picture of those that are kind of including themselves in everything. As he goes ahead and he says, don't do these specific things. He's painting a negative picture. Now, this is not an all-inclusive list of all the things that you can do wrong, but Paul talks about the people that are self-indulgent, they're pleasure seekers, those that are quarrelsome, those who, who are people of strife, who are jealous and malicious, those who are concerned for self and self alone. That's the picture he is painting. And he's saying, you need to not be this type of person because you are a Christian. You have changed your life. But Paul also emphasizes that we need to be careful then how we use our, our world, our, how we use our body in this world. He emphasizes that if we came out of sin, then how can we continue in sin? We've talked about this this morning. You see, Paul also says that we're supposed to use our bodies not as instruments of unrighteousness. Now, sometimes we fail to realize the mind is an instrument of our body. It's part of our body. So what we fill our minds with also will make a difference of how we treat that body. How we work in this life. How we, we view things around us. This morning we talked about the repentance and how it is an inward change. It is an inward change of the mind and how you think and what you do. Inside, it is a change. The transformation, but then that transformation leads to outward transformation. But brethren, if we are soaking up everything from this world, all the bad and all the evil and everything else in our lives, and that's all we have 24-7, then I'm telling you right now, it, the mind will direct the body. Sooner or later, it will influence us. But he also goes on and he says, look at Romans chapter 13 now. Uh, uh, Romans chapter 13 beginning in verse 12 because the next thing he says is not only do we need to ensure that our behavior is correct but then he goes ahead and he says in verse uh, <clears throat> in verse 12 that that we need to also uh, lay aside lay aside the deeds of darkness and that we need to put on the armor of light Paul is saying we need to arm ourselves. We need to prepare ourselves. We need to make sure that we are going ahead and putting ourselves in battle array. Now we've heard the, about the armor of light plenty of times. And in Ephesians chapter 6, verse, uh, verses 13 through 17, here Paul going ahead and talking about the, the uh, battle arraignment, the, the armor of light. He goes ahead and he kind of goes down this list of different things. In Ephesians chapter uh, 6, verses 14, beginning, he says that we put on or we gird the, the word of truth. And then when we gird our loins with the truth, what we are doing is we are preparing ourselves for battle. He says that you protect your heart or you protect your uh, um, chest with that, that breastplate. What are we protecting with a breastplate? I mean, the breastplate is made for specific protection is to protect these vital organs one of the most vital organs is our heart see when we look at this and we are talking about righteousness should we not be protecting our heart should we not ensure that the things that are coming into our heart into our minds that they don't 
they don't produce evil thoughts. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, we're told, out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts. The things that defile a man are the things of his thought. We're also told that we need to cover our feet and prep ourselves with the gospel of peace. I love the way that Paul puts this because he also goes on in Romans chapter uh, 10, verses 15, and he talks about how, how beautiful the feet of those who, who bring the gospel. We are to deliver the gospel. He says that we are to defend ourselves with the shield of faith, ensuring that we're protecting ourselves against Satan. He tells us that we need to fight back from Satan's, uh, or ha arm ourselves with the, the helmet of salvation. Again, what does the helmet protect? It protects our head, the, one of the most vital parts of our body. Without a head, you're not surviving. And here he says, you need to arm yourself with that helmet. Protect your mind. Protect your thoughts. But then he also goes ahead and he says, you need to arm yourself. Be able to fight and defend against Satan. With what? With the word of truth, the sword of the spirit, the word of God. Each and every one of these pieces are instrumental for us to be able to overcome the things of, God, uh, the things of Satan. To be able to overcome the things of this world because we will absolutely be attacked. But he goes on and he says... On top of all of these things, on top of arming yourself with this, look in verse 14, back in Romans chapter 13, verse 14, he says, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provisions for the flesh in regards to its lust. Here, when we look at this and we hear this and we, it says to put on the Lord Jesus Christ, the first thing that comes to our mind will most likely be baptism. We need to put on Christ in baptism. We're told in Galatians 3, verse 27, that all have, who have been baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. We understand that. But I want you to understand that it is more than just baptism that, that Paul is talking about here. Yes, it has its place, but who is Paul talking to again? He is talking to those who are already Christians, those who have accepted Christ. And therefore, it must mean more. And what does it mean? You see, it's also that we need to submit to Christ. Yes, amen. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21, we're told that baptism is not just the washing of the filth from the flesh, but it is a, an appeal. It is a call. It is a, a request from God, from a good conscience. And he, or to God for a good conscience. And when we look at this and we understand this, we need to understand that we have to submit to the Lord. We need to free ourselves from sin and then submit ourselves to be slaves of righteousness to God. Yes. To ensure that we are under His guidance, following His word and not our own. But also, he says, it's not just submitting, it's also putting on a new self. You see, when we talk about baptism, we say that we put away the old man of sin and we become a new creature. We change, we become something different. Now we walk in the newness of life. Do we truly believe that? Do we truly believe that we are different creatures or are we the same person just sporting Christianity as a type? You see, look with me in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4. In Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 17. Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 17. Because when we hear these words from Paul, we start to gain an understanding of what he means by putting on this new life, this new self. In Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 17 down to 24, he says, So this I say. And I affirm that with the Lord that you no longer walk as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of their ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And then he says, and they have become callous and have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. Brethren, have we become callous? Callous to the word 
callous to receiving the word. He says then in verse 20, but you did not learn Christ in this way. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by in him, just as truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your, old, to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of, the, uh, of deceit, and that you re be renewed in, your, in the spirit of your mind and put, a, uh, put on the new self which is in the likeness of God and has been created in the righteousness and holiness of the truth. Brethren, we need to put on that new self. We need to ensure that we have that new self already dawned as Christians. You see, too often, we start to clean out all the big sins in our lives. We ensure that we are making sure that nobody sees those big things, but what about all the small things? Are we tending to those? You know, they... When we go ahead and we look at all of those things that, that Paul goes ahead and says, he talks about becoming callous. Do you know those small things start to become larger? Those small things, those small sins that we allow in our lives, if we allow them long enough, we become callous to them. Society is doing a great job in making us callous in making us desensitized to the things and the sins that are around us. There was a time where we look on TV and it was extremely hard to see some type of, of sensuality, sexuality being promoted out there on the TV. Now, you look at a commercial, five seconds and you'll see that. Homosexuality was something that was not talked about in times past. Now. Every single TV show, including kids' show, shows, including cartoons, they all promote homosexuality, transgenderism, all of the things that are completely against God. They're promoting and they're pushing and they're showing. Why? Because the more they push, the more that goes into our children's mind, the more that we accept little by little, it just becomes the norm. And we kind of don't even flinch anymore. Homosexuality is oh, I mean, it's just homosexuality. It's no big deal. Yeah, you know what? I, I understand it's cursing. I understand foul language is probably, but that's not that bad of a sin. You see, little by little, we become callous to those things. We start to close up our hearts to the truth and allow those other things to become the norm. Paul tells us we have to be careful. We have to be careful because he says the very next thing. He says, you see, we can't make provisions for the flesh. Paul says, make no provision for the flesh in verse 14. Now, what does he mean by that? I mean, have you ever thought about that? When he says, make no provision for the flesh, is he talking about, well, I don't need to make sure, I need to make sure that I don't give this fleshly body any food, any substance. I don't make, I make sure that it doesn't have water, it doesn't have sleep, because I'm making no provision for the flesh. Obviously, that's not the case. But do you understand that that's exactly what people thought back then? There were those that were called Gnostics, that that's exactly what they believed. They believed that their soul was cleansed, it was clean and pure, and the flesh, well, it was corrupted. And so we can make no provisions for the flesh. But here, Paul is not talking about the physical stuff. He is saying, make sure that you make no provisions for the flesh in its lusts. That's the qualifier. In other words, we do not allow those small things to supply the flesh in lusts. What does that mean for us today? That means that we need to ensure that there is nothing that we are allowing into our lives that is going to supply those fleshly desires. That sensuality. That when we see things that are not in accordance to God's word, that we challenge it and we stop it from coming into our lives. That we don't just wink at it and say, eh, it's all right, you know, things happen. That's why Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 21 through 22, to examine everything carefully, to hold fast, to abstain, he says, from every form of evil. 
Have you thought about that? To, form, to abstain from every form of evil. That word form that Paul uses here means every appearance. It means anything that even looks like evil. Anything that even potentially looks like evil, Paul says abstain from it. Because remember, we're supposed to keep our behavior proper. There's always someone watching. There's always things. So what does that mean for us today? How do we do that? If somebody's having problems with pornography, then we keep away from those things. We put blocks on our phones. We ensure that we are not frequenting places that go ahead and lead us into that way. If we are having a problem with language, then maybe we ought not hang around with specific people that have that type of language. If we have problems with how we deal with one another in love, maybe we should not fill our minds with every bit of hatred in this world, from TV to news broadcast to everything else that is filtering and telling us, you know what, hate your man. Maybe we need to look to the scriptures and fill our minds with the scriptures and have trust and faith in the Lord. You know, today we've looked at Paul's important warning to Christians, calling us, calling every Christian, not those that were just there in Rome, but us today. He calls us all to be vigilant, to ensure that we're prepared for the coming of the Lord that will no doubt come. But he says to prepare yourself. You need to do a couple of things. You need to put away those deeds of darkness. You need to arm yourselves with that armor of light. And you need to put on Christ, ensuring that you make no provisions for the flesh, ensuring that you're doing what he has asked. So the question for you today is, have you woken up to Christ's call? Because if you haven't, why not do it today? You see, if you haven't accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you have not gone ahead and responded to the gospel call the way that the Lord has asked of us, the way we see within the scriptures, you have the opportunity to do it right now because tomorrow may not come. But I will tell you this. A lot of times we look at that and we hear those words and we say, well, that doesn't apply to me because I'm a Christian. Paul was not talking to those who are lost. He was talking to Christians. Brethren, Christianity is more than a name and a title. It is a way of life. It is a change of life. If there's one who then looks at their life and notices, you know what? I have been making provisions for the flesh. I have been doing the very things that the Lord has asked me not to do. I am not prepared. And if the Lord came today, I would be lost. Let's make the change today. Let's not wait another moment. If you're one who in any way needs the prayers of the saints, needs to, to go ahead and, and study some more, or needs to get right in the sight of God, responding to the gospel call, won't you do so today? If you're one who's subject in any way, please come forward as we stand and sing the song of encouragement.